since this video has gotten so long, um, I've decided I'm going to upload two versions. of. I do love the single extremely long video, so uh, I'm going to upload that first to the channel. That's going to be the full five hour marathon video of the, uh, I don't know what it will necessarily be when it's cut down, but that'll be the full video, including the introduction, part selection, as well as the PC build. Um, and uh, I will also have linked down in the description below where you can watch the three separate parts. So that will be part one, part two, and part three uploaded as three separate videos just to make it a little bit easier to navigate. This is part one of my Linux workstation and server PC build guide. So this video is going to cover the introduction to the video. Um, parts two and three will be on part selection as well as the actual building of the computer. Those are linked in the description below. Please check it out after you watch this one. As the popularity of self-hosting grows, more and more people are looking at setting up small, efficient home servers to manage their files, emails, contacts, and so on and so forth to help remove their reliance to cloud services. In this video, I would like to show you how you can build a compelling price-to-performance oriented home server. Mind you, this computer is no slouch when it comes to productivity use either. In fact, when I built this computer for myself, it was designed to be used as my main workstation computer, not as a server. And a lot of my parts choices reflect this. For example, the inclusion of GPUs and extra USB cards um, help augment the fact that uh, this server motherboard, which is normally designed for you know, server enclosures, can actually quite easily be adapted to work for use in workstations as well. In fact, I would assume that this is one of the best ways to get your hands on 16 cores and 32 threads worth of processing power for a low price. Now, before I talk more about the details of home servers and whatnot, while the motherboard and some parts may be originally designed for server use, it also makes for an excellent workstation computer. Whether this be for video editing or programming, I can tell you that this computer has crunched through everything I've thrown at it. For example, for over two years, this computer has been my primary workstation system for software engineering and software development. And this is one of the reasons why I opted for more powerful CPUs as opposed to GPUs, because a lot of program compiling uh, relies heavily on CPU power. And especially if you're going to be working with multi-threaded applications, it's an excellent use. This computer was excellent for when I was working on Open Embedded and the Octo project, since it could easily blaze its way through bit-baked tasks given the multi-threaded processing. Now, as I will mention in the rest of the video, there are other ways you could get your hands on this. And in fact, there are more modern ways you could get your hands on lots of cores for processing, whether it be with something like a Threadripper or a modern like Alder Lake i7, or with something like a Ryzen 5950X with 16 cores. And of course, that would be a lot faster, given that those 16 cores are Zen 3, which is a much more modern architecture um, and isn't built on Intel's 22 nanometer or 32 nanometer process from some time ago. Um, but also, you have to consider the price difference between going for a brand new Ryzen 5950X and how cheap you can get these Xeons on the used market. And I would say that for this price, if you were going brand new, you'd only be looking at like a six core Ryzen. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that later, but I think that's part of why I made the decision. Now, of course, this computer is great for things beyond just software development as well. For example, all of my YouTube videos for the past two over two years have been edited on this very machine. I've used it as my primary video editing rig. We'll talk a bit about how you can optimize for that in the part selection. But in short, video rendering likes lots of cores, likes GPU acceleration, and likes fast storage, all of which you can do uh, with a machine of this caliber. And finally, since it was originally destined for server use, the computer features a ton of SATA storage and a lot of PCIe lanes. Because compared to consumer platforms, Xeons ship with way more PCIe lanes, meaning you can do stuff like throw in tons of M.2 storage if you want, uh, along with uh, the SATA if you wanted to build this into a very fast like storage cluster. There are a lot of uses for this, and we'll talk about that as the video goes. So hopefully I think this explains part of the workstation aspect and why you might want to use a system like this as your daily driver um, and, the, and the changes you would have to make to the parts if you wanted to use it as a daily driver as opposed to using it as a server. Now let's talk a bit about how this can be used in various server applications. There are a variety of reasons you might be looking at building a home server or starting a small home lab. It could be, for example, that you want to share files securely with friends and family through an application like Nextcloud. Maybe you want to host your own calendar system using Radical. 
Maybe you have a CCTV solution and you don't want to have to pay cloud subscriptions and maybe you want to do this with an application like ZoneMinder or Shinobi. Well, many people use applications like Home Assistant to tie together many different smart home ecosystems. Or perhaps you just want to build a NAS to securely store all your files from your laptop or desktop or other computers. And maybe you want to have redundancy. So maybe you want to have a RAID solution so you can lose any one of the hard drives instead of, you know, having buckets upon buckets of external hard drives you want to organize your data. Or maybe you just want to learn some DevOps and you want to learn about Docker and Kubernetes or how to use Linux. A lot of these are excellent reasons for why you might want to build a small server. A lot of these services can be hosted on your local network. And to do this, many people are looking towards running small, efficient home servers. Now, there are of course a couple of very popular choices. For example, the Raspberry Pi 4, now available with up to 8 gigabytes of RAM. Very low power, very efficient, but kind of lacking in the performance department uh, since it's using a quad-core A72, I believe. And people have definitely pushed it to its limits through uses like the PoE hat, and there are a variety of applications. It has essentially become the de facto small single board computer. Um, don't get me wrong, the Pi is an excellent platform. However, it's very easy to outgrow a Raspberry Pi. The C, you're limited by its CPU with four ARMv8 cores, and you're also going to be limited by either by I.O. Even if you decide to skip the SD card and boot off of SSDs, you're still going to be running all of your I.O., whether it be SSD based or hard drive based, off of the USB ports. And while this might be fine for basic uses, when you start getting into NAS territory, this kind of starts to suffer. The limitations of USB start to show. Computers like the HP ProDesk or Dell Optiplex are fan favorites for their very good price to performance, given how cheap you can get them on the used market as well as the fact that they provide enough performance to run most applications. Now, this will get you to a certain point. If you're going to run one or two applications on the computer, these are excellent solutions. Those computers usually have, you know, quad-core CPUs and maybe 8 gigabytes or maybe 16 gigs of RAM and a single hard drive and an SSD. That's great when you're starting out, but what if you simply want to have a bit more power than that? This is when you start getting into more exotic servers, whether it be through the use of enterprise servers like your, your Dell R710s or your HP servers, or the route I'm going to show you in this video, which is how to build a very compelling uh, price to performance oriented home server using Xeons and a server motherboard. But if you want to either try Docker or Kubernetes, or maybe you'd want to also be able to run virtual machines, right? It's always great to be able to isolate the different applications you have running. And the best way to do this is through virtual machines. This way you can have the server acting in many different roles. You can have a NAS running in one VM using your hard drives or arrays, however you configure it. You can have your file share running on one of them. You can have your custom DNS, something like a pie hole running on a VM. Um, and you can have your media server on another, so on and so forth. It makes it very easy to expand and determine exactly how your resource is going to go. And it's a lot safer because if one of them gets compromised, now you also know that your whole server isn't compromised. The traditional ways to do this would have been through, a pro so through software like VMware ESXi. Given that VMware is being sold to Broadcom, uh, I'm not sure how that one's going to end up. Um, but VMware ESXi is one of the popular options. Another very popular option, particularly with the more Linux-oriented people, is Proxmox. Proxmox CE, which is the community edition, also provides a way to virtualize any number of virtual desktops. And it also supports a lot of different use cases. It even works with GPU pass-through if you wanted to do two gamers, one CPU. Maybe not that one. Um, but having a system like this will provide a lot of flexibility and a lot of potential expansion room for the future. So this video is going to be divided into two main parts. The first part is the part selection. So this is essentially going to be a description of which parts I'm using and why I chose to use those parts over others. And we'll talk, uh, and I'll talk about a lot of different options you have. For example, should you go with new CPUs or used CPUs? And what about motherboards? And what platforms you might want to go for, whether it be on the Intel side or the AMD side? We'll also talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the pricing of these different parts and how they might fit in and what features you might be missing out on if you choose to go with one platform compared to another. The second thing I want to discuss in this video is going to be the actual how to build the server part. The great thing about doing this a DIY way is that you know what your applications are. If you're going to be running something that's very CPU intensive, you can always pop in a, a, a CPU, either with more cores if you want more parallelization, or with a faster clock rate if you know that your application is going to be mostly single-threaded, something like a game server. Um, or you might know that you maybe want to do some AI or ML research, and you're going to want to throw a GPU in there. Or maybe you're going to run databases, and you need tons of RAM for it. The great thing about the DIY server and PC space is that you can customize your solution based on your needs and requirements. And it's also very easy to expand it in the future. If you should you need more RAM or you need a GPU or you want to add more hard drives. A lot of these solutions are standard, which means it's also very easy to expand in the future. 
The second part of this video is going to be able to put it together. Now, of course, this will depend on the parts that I have chosen, but as I said, um, I'll go into detail about why I chose parts and the different alternatives you might have. But I basically haven't cut anything out. I've felt I, I've left myself free to go into as much detail as I wanted on topics, which is why this video uh, pre-editing is over five hours long, uh, not including the intro that I'm recording right now. Um, <laughs> So this is definitely going to be a nerd edition video. Uh, it's definitely going to be very rambly, but I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoy the video. All right, so this was part one. Uh, part two and three are available and uh, linked down below. See you in part two.